from me, Roy Miestach, and welcome to Derek Eretz, The Way of the World. In today's show, Ilana Stein explains how Judaism views our responsibility to the environment. Sol Cowan offers energy-saving strategies, and Ben Getz shares his passion for the earth. Founder of Jewish Eco Seminars, Rabbi Yonatan Nerol explains that Jewish tradition teaches us that we only merit the opportunity to rule the earth if we behave righteously. This includes the spiritual discipline to use our resources wisely and with a sense of moral responsibility. In today's times, people appear to demonstrate an ability to subdue the earth. Ilana Stein elaborates further. The history of the environment in Judaism, the respect for the environment in Judaism goes all the way back to Genesis. Right in the beginning, the fact that we have um, the story of the creation of the earth in Genesis, in the five books of Moses, which in essence is a book about a moral life, tells us that the story of Genesis must be there for a reason. And there are a couple of reasons that it is in the book of Genesis. One though of the reasons is definitely to give us an understanding that God took the trouble to make the earth with all its beauties, whether over six days or 15 billion years is irrelevant. Really, it's about the fact that there, there is purpose to the world and there is a unifying structure to the world that comes about through the, its creator um, taking the time and trouble to create it. Once we have that point in Genesis 1, in Genesis 2 verse 15, we have the seminal command where God tells Adam and Eve to work the earth and protect it. Le'ovda u le'shomra in Hebrew. And le'ovda u le'shomra gives us the quintessential balance that we need to find within uh, our place on the planet. Our balance on this earth requires us to of course use it, use all its riches, use the resources, but do it in a sustainable way. So le ovda is to work the earth, to make sure that we get what we need to from it. But le shomra, the word le shmor, to protect, um, in essence implies that you have something precious, something that is not always going to be there perhaps. And so le, le shomra tells us that we need to make sure to use the earth, but use it sustainably. So right in the very, very beginning, before the annals of humankind, before um, we come to really the story of Abraham even, in other words, the universal part of our book, we have the instructions by the Creator telling us to work with the earth, but do so not as rulers, but as administrators, if you will, as people who can use everything we'd like on the earth, but we make sure to do it in a way that doesn't destroy it. So that's your, your basic ethical moral introduction, shall we say, to what the human being as the pinnacle of creation, according to Genesis 1, needs to do on this planet. One of the most hard hitting uh, sayings that I've found is one that's in a midrash, which is a a visual story given over over two and a half thousand years ago, which talks about God walking through the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. And he's showing them all the trees of the garden. And he says to them, look at my world, how beautiful it is. If you destroy it, there is no one who is coming to fix it for you. And that's from Kohelet Rabbah, um, a very ancient Midrash, as I said. And why that is so hard hitting, of course, is that two and a half thousand years ago, the rabbis and sages understood that it was up to us, that we can't sit back and think that someone is going to come and save the world. We ourselves are going to have to look after it. And if we don't, we ourselves will pay the price. And so it's up to us to make sure that we, in fact, follow the dictates of the Torah all the way back then all those thousands of years ago, the dictates are simple. They're telling us exactly what we need to do. We need to live lightly and we need to live well. And we can do both. When 
Ben Getz founded Urban Harvest Edible Gardens, he felt that it was the expression of his love for this earth. He believes that we are as responsible for the earth's well-being, just as it is responsible for ours. By working with nature, Ben aims to show that if we create an abundance of healthy, organic and locally grown food in our urban environment, we can reawaken a deeper reverence for the earth and practically re-establish a healthier balance in our lives. My love for gardening and, and being in nature and being with plants came from an early age, um, spending time with my grandmother in nature. Walking from her home to shul on, on Shabbat, on Saturday we would walk from, we would walk across Sea Point um, and we'd stop at the rock pools. And the other thing is that she loved to tell stories and she was a fantastic storyteller. And specifically, she told the stories of the, the Old Testament. She told the stories from the five books of Moses and that every story has a moral, but not, in fact, not just a moral. Every story is full of lessons and wisdom and, um, and that one can be and should be creative in terms of how one understands stories and how one tells stories. And I think that nature tells a story. Every single garden we create is a story. Um, we've, to date, created 324 food gardens around Cape Town and every single one is unique and every single one is a story which is specific to that context and specific to the particular beneficiaries and I think that gardens are incredible in that way they really are full of wisdom if we take the time to stop and and pay attention and get our hands involved and our eyes involved and our ears and our nose and our whole body is involved. Um, I think primarily um, maybe the two most important therapies of being in the garden are just watching nature do its thing because we don't do much in a garden. We kind of set the ball rolling and then we let things happen and we watch uh, the miracle of nature, the miracle of, of, of existence unfold. And then the second thing that we learn in the garden uh, is that you reap what you sow. So what you put in, you get out. Urban harvest is so much more than just uh, growing food. Um, in fact, the, the, the core of it, the, the, the main pillar of it is, is social upliftment. And I started a society at UCT, which was a art of living and yoga society at UCT. And so what we did is every week we went to um, a township, uh, Masipumalele Township near Fishuk, um, and we worked with a community there of children um, at a youth center, and we set up a food garden for them uh, with them. And part of our sort of weekly activity was tending to the food garden again, um, imparting all sorts of different experiences and knowledge. But the main one being, you reap what you sow. But the the, as the main aspect was. Um, giving of our time as a, as a young group of students uh, to help improve the lives of others and uh, absolutely at the same time improving our own lives. Uh, growing up I used to be involved in uh, home gardens as well as um, farming projects so it was something that I had passion for but just didn't have a place where I could actually you know bring my passion out. It was then when I came to Eben Harvest that I actually see that uh, there is more to farming and actually something more interesting than what I already knew. Urban Harvest has installed and maintained 324 food gardens around Cape Town to date. About 40% of those food gardens are in community context. So what Urban Harvest does is we work with the community to design a unique and beautiful vegetable garden. We build the garden together with the community and we uh, run edu maintenance, which is education and maintenance support to make sure that the gardens are sustainable in the long term. Urban Harvest approached the school um, for a place to have their offices and we had a space for them so they came and um, set up their offices here and they also made a beautiful garden um, which is for the school and it's for the children so they manage the garden but the children also have a lot of input they come they harvest they help plant they help weed they help with the upkeep they help with watering 
We do lessons in the vegetable garden, so we've got a really great relationship going with Urban Harvest and the vegetable garden. So broccoli is actually a flower, the same as cauliflower, it's called cauliflower, they look very similar, maybe we'll find a cauliflower over there. So we've got some broccoli, what else can you guys see that's ready for harvest here? Okay, spinach, right? Lots and lots and lots of spinach. The garden means a lot to the kids at the school. Number one, it has a lot of vitamins. It's freshly harvested from the garden, straight to the pot, and the children enjoy it. And I try to incorporate most of what is in the garden into the meal. Whatever there is, I try to work and incorporate it into each dish. Taste-wise, uh, Usually the poison is got after effects in plants. So if it's your leafy crops that you put uh, fertilizers and pesticides, you might end up getting a bitter taste when you harvest. Whereas uh, in organic farming, it's actually having food in its natural uh, state. Less um, side effects as well as it's healthy. I would say the most important thing about this vegetable that makes it special is that it's very 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 fresh because if you buy something from the shop it may have been traveling for a week before it gets to the shop and then it stays on the sh on the shelf for days and days before you buy it. This we just harvested two minutes ago and if you feel it it's heavy. A lettuce doesn't normally feel so heavy. <laughs> in the beginning people are getting into it because um, they're talking about yeah we need fresh food for the feeding scheme um, but very soon it becomes much much more than that it becomes a source of pride um, at a lot of the community projects when somebody new comes department of education or or any visitor one of the first places that the, that the principal will take them is to the garden. Come and have a look at our garden. And it's, so it's a source of pride, it's a source of inspiration, and it also generates more interest in the school, so positive PR and, and more investment in the school, from the school itself and from outside. I would uh, describe Ben as a man who's uh, full of uh, knowledge in terms of farming. Uh, which obviously has developed through the years he's been involved in farming. And I think uh, for somebody who hasn't met Ben, there is quite a lot to learn in terms of organic farming. In terms of uh, what I've learned from him, well, there is much to say, but <laughs> in, uh, let me uh, maybe stick to, to urban gardens, which I've managed to suck as much um, uh, knowledge on how to, 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 to design and to incorporate different things into, into the garden and to, uh, you know, to make, uh, the, to, to put in um, tangible the vision that a client or a person has in the mind. I think that Derek Eretz, um, if I were to translate it more or less directly, I would say it's, it's the way of the land. Um, and, and to be more poetic about it, I'd say that it's actually about the way of nature. And for myself, it's a question I've been asking myself my whole life, which is, what is my nature and what is my purpose on the planet? And I think that in terms of what, our, what is our nature, everyone has a unique fingerprint. Everyone has an absolutely unique purpose to fulfill on the planet. The one thing that I think connects us is that um, the one thing that we share is that I believe that we're all here to make a positive difference and to be generous and loving and supportive of each other and of nature. advent of global warming and other ecological concerns have heightened public awareness in environmental issues, which are now a major component in the strategies adopted by corporate South Africa. In 2000, Johannesburg's first executive mayor, Amos Mosondo, appointed Sol Cowan with the responsibility of overseeing the regeneration of the inner city of Johannesburg. 
Today, Sol, together with his partner Greg Sloan, specialize in advising, designing and implementing energy saving strategies and renewable energy solutions. My mother comes from Poland uh, and during 1939 with her, with her father and mother and her sister, they were forced to leave Poland. My father's history is he comes from the UK originally. They were entrepreneurs of great enormity. They started various businesses. So what I learned is you're able to take risk and failure, and we may have failure, but you pick yourself up. The second thing is whatever you make, um, whatever you earn, make certain that you give back because that's really the art of what living is all about. It's, you know, it cannot all be just pure selfishness. When people are in need, uh, when others are in need, wherever possible, see you know, how you can help as a human being. And I think those are the traits I learned from both from my mother and father. I got involved with um, who is my partner today in a, in a company. He runs a company called Metermate. And we formed a company called Absolute Energy Solutions. And as, as I was saying, prepaid electricity meters, there was no demand. Suddenly we realized because of the functioning of council, as well as the price hikes that was coming through from ESCOM because of um, various issues and uh, load shedding, etc., etc., suddenly uh, property owners realized that in essence, for them to, to, to manage their buildings, they should have a better relationship with their tenants. And in order to have a better relationship, they started buying and managing the electricity through prepaid electricity. And that's where we came in. What you find is in the inner city, your utility bill is quite a large component of your cost of accommodation. And your, your consumption in some, some flats and things is very high. Um, and with a prepaid meter, the way that you consume electricity, you're able to budget, you're able to monitor your consumption, you can check instantaneously on the meter how many watts are actually going through the meter. So although it's not an energy saving device, it, it's, you, you, by looking at your consumption, you're able to budget just as you do on a prepaid cell phone. And then Greg, um, who's, who has a passion for technologies, believed that the time was right for introducing new and green technologies. And that's where we got involved in, in, in what we called a, a joint venture with another company and a, another group of people to introduce heat pumps into buildings. So heat pumps work on the, on the, on the basis of heating up the water, but in a much more efficient manner than using normal geysers or um, central uh, or electric elements. But the theory and the practicality is that once you put heat pumps and you spec it properly into a building to heat up uh, the water for the tenants, um, there are huge savings. But on a conservative level, a heat pump in a building um, will save you at least 40 to 50 percent of your electricity bill. When I look at absolute energy, we don't, we don't sell product, we sell solutions. We provide solutions, we look for solutions. So our, some of our other solutions that we provide with one of our other joint venture partners is lighting for, for buildings, mainly the passages and the parking, you know, um, what they call LED lighting and linking that to sensors so that, you know, movement centers so that the lights do not stay on the whole time, 24 hours a day. So these are the type of technologies that we look at and types of um, um, on, uh, solutions that we can provide. Solutions give you the whole answer. So you might find that you've, you buy a product from a company and you install that and it does its, its trick. Um, it's saving electricity or saving water, whatever it might be, but you don't have a way of measuring if there's savings. And you might find that it saves in a certain way, um, but doesn't provide savings to your whole solution as well, your whole, whole consumption. So when you provide a solution, you try to provide a measurement method to prove that you're saving. And often this is required from, from a point of view, maybe if it's an ESKIM project, you need to prove that there's savings. 
um, or if it's from an investor point of view to now increase the capacity of the system or improve the system, um, you, you need this measurement and verification. Uh, so the solution to a whole problem um, it gives you a holistic uh, solution, I guess. When you see people like Elon Musk and various other players looking at the world differently and trying to find solutions on how the world should function, and in, in that whole environment has to be green technology, has to be technology such as photovoltaics, which uses the sun to produce electricity, has to be desalinization of water, uh, because there's such a shortage of water in countries like um, South Africa and various other countries. And that, because of people like my partner Greg, uh, that, that was always looking at, out of the box, and never, never confined to the narrow space. That's what, uh, th that is how I've been installed or the passion has, you know, and obviously making something work from nothing. Uh, Sol's a very passionate person. Uh, he um, is very enthusiastic uh, about certain initiatives and uh, he's straight down the line. He'll tell you yay or nay <laughs> and contributed a lot to, to Joburg in terms of the environment, the upgrading of the city. If you drive around with Sol in the car, he's always looking at a traffic light that's out or a hole that's in the pavement or a water leaking here or there and although he's not part of part of the council now he still has the connections that he can report things to so it's effectively beyond the call of duty because he's it's no longer his duty but he still does it derech eretz or ethics in essence it's about how we conduct ourselves with our fellow human beings but it, it goes more than that is, you know, people put you into positions of power. There's two ways of playing it. Either, either you play it straight uh, with no hidden agendas or you, you join some of the other clan uh, where, where it's not about the people, it's not about your, your goal of serving, but it's your goal of self-aggrandization uh, and self-serving. Self and it's the same in, in business, you know. Obviously, there's a, a profit motive. I mean, that's what makes businesses survive. But it, it, it becomes more than that. You know, it's your passion for, for what you're doing. And it's also how you handle people. Judaism, with its rich heritage and history of respect for nature and all forms of life, is in a perfect position to inform a better adjusted and more balanced environmental ethic. In Genesis Rabbi 10 verse 7, Rabbi Simon said, there is no plant without an angel in heaven tending it and telling it grow. We would love for you to join our conversation. So share your thoughts and stories on our Facebook page, Derek Eretz Connect. From me, Romy Stach and the Derek Eretz team, if you look after the world, the world will be good to you.